Excellent. So yeah, my name is Nathan Eggy. I am an engineering manager at Google. And as Larry said, I am one of the co-chairs on the RISE Technical Steering Committee. Um, and I also chair the System Libraries Working Group, one of the nine that Larry mentioned. And in this talk, um, I'll be speaking in that capacity about some of the work we've been doing in the System Libraries Group to look at optimizing software for RISC-V. Um, so as, as Larry said, the mission of RISE is really around accelerating the development of open source software. Um, there's a lot of work already happening in the open source community around RISC-V, and we would like to make that go a lot faster. Um, within the System Libraries Working Group, we thought really hard around, you know, what does that mean? And we came up with this charter statement. Basically, we'd like to focus on high leverage initiatives that unblock uh, upstream projects and bring RISC-V to the same functionality and performance as other ISAs, right? So we really want to understand what's going on in the community that's preventing that from happening and work to remove those barriers. Um, we came with, up with a list of sort of tasks that are in scope and things that are out of scope. Um, you know, as Larry said, uh, we're going to publish best practices guides. Um, we're going we're to work on open source tooling, uh, do some case studies. We're going to actually write software optimizations, um, do some benchmarking, and really understand the dependency analysis to see what, what are the critical areas that need to be worked on. Things are out of scope, uh, proprietary or vendor extensions, you know, non-ratified extensions, uh, closed source software. We're really only focused on the open source ecosystem um, and any private repos. You know, everything we do is, is in the public. Um, and, in, and in particular, we push uh, all of our development work upstream um, on the upstream projects, right? So there's no secret rise uh, work. Everything is done um, right there with the upstream developers. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about uh, a case study that we did within the System Libraries Working Group to really understand what this means. So the idea was, if we're going to ask upstream projects to, to adopt this new ISA, and add optimizations to their project. We really want to know what that means, right? What are we, what are we asking them to do? So we did a case study um, within RISE to add RVV 1.0 optimizations to an existing project. In this case, we looked at the, the David AV1 decoder. Um, this, this project's kind of interesting. It's got, got goals of being the fastest possible software decoder. Um, it needs to be cross-platform, and it needs to have a very small binary size. Um, and it does this through a whole lot of handwritten assembly. So, these are the stats from slow count earlier this week. It's got 234,000 lines of handwritten assembly and only 40,000 lines of C code. Um, it's basically a C orchestrator around DSP functions. And what's really nice about it is it's a great place to test uh, our RISC-V optimizations because it's got this excellent testing framework, which I'll get into in a moment. So it's got two components to that testing framework. The first is correctness testing. Um, the idea is that uh, they've got this checksum tool. It basically iterates over um, all the different uh, you know, CPU features, generates uh, some random input data with padding, calls a DSP function uh, in C and in an assembly, compares the output to make sure they're the same, and then checks that the padding is not overwritten. Right? So it's exactly the sort of thing you'd like if you were going to write brand new, uh, brand new assembly. Um, it's also got integration tests. So it can decode a bunch of videos and make sure that the decoded output is correct. So what did we do? Um, we decided to write you know, a single function and integrate it. So we wrote um, one of the DSP functions, a little 4x4 transform. Um, we used hardware cap to do detection of uh, RVV 1.0. And in doing so, we found a couple of bugs and um, some of the ways that, that that's exposed. Um, it was only about 200 instructions, so it wasn't particularly a lot of work. Uh, but what was a bunch of work was adding all the C code to do all that orchestration, right? So within the David project, quite a bit of the work initially was just getting all the testing working and all the integration working. Um, but this was enough. Like once we did that, uh, you can see that we were able to run CheckSM and it verified that that function works correctly. Let's talk about performance. So David also has a great um, tooling for doing performance measurement. So within the CheckSM framework, uh, basically, it runs the C code in a loop n times, and it runs the assembly code in a loop n times, and then it computes the speed up. Um, this lets us do a, a bunch of things, right? So the first thing it lets us do is you know, see if our RVV code is actually faster than the C code. Um, it also lets us uh, do comparisons to other implementations. So we can look at you know, a, a VLAN of 128 versus a VLAN of 256, and kind of we would expect that if you you know, if you widen your SIMD, that you would expect a proportional increase in the performance. And it also means that, um, you know, we can compare ISAs, right? So we could basically 
try to find hardware that's equivalent, run the same benchmarks on the same kind of class of hardware, and then compare them and see if we actually have uh, software that's performing as expected, right? Which is kind of a nice, a nice feature because um, you, know, you don't know if the problem is inherent in the algorithm or it's inherent in the hardware or it's inherent in your use of the hardware. Um, and I'd like to point at this quadrilateral at the bottom of the screen. So one of the things you can do is you can compare, you know, for, for different ISAs, you can compare C code to C code, right? You can compare the C code to the assembly code. Um, and then you can also compare assembly to assembly, right? And when you compare C to C, you're looking to see if the scalar code is being um, you know, executed uh, equivalently. If you're looking from C to assem, you're looking for the proportional speed up. And if you're looking assembly to assembly, you're looking to make sure that you're using the, the right algorithms. Um, so in order to do this with a David tool, it's really simple. You just add dash dash bench to the same, same tooling. Um, and if you look at the bottom, you can see that's the output of it. Uh, this was back in October of last year. And so at that point, there really wasn't any available hardware. So this is all running under QMU. And uh, you know, it's not really clear that there's a benefit to the RVV, right? This actually shows that the, um, the assembly is actually running slower under QMU. Um, and this is sort of expected because you know, it's doing more work in some sense, um, but it also kind of brings up sort of a limitation of the tooling at the time, right? If we're going to ask open source developers to do early adoption and do some of this, this work, you know, how do they know that what they've done is effective? And in particular, most projects, when you give them optimizations, they say, well, can you put a, a comment in the code or in the commit message to tell me what the, what the speed up is, right? So this was a real challenge to, to getting early adoption. Um, in particular, another thing kind of came up at this point, which is that if that's the only tool right now to do verification of correctness on risk 5 and we're asking people to write more RVV, then what will happen is as that code lands upstream, QMU will continue to run slower and slower, right? As you try to boot Linux, if it's got more, say, memory or string operations, that's not a great thing. It will actually make it harder for people to do work. And so uh, we kind of recognize that this is a hindrance to this innovation cycle, and RISE put out an RFP to improve uh, QME performance, Larry talked about our RFP process. Um, and this actually went out last year um, and was awarded, and work has actually begun to, to improve that. So that's one of the ways that RISE is trying to help out with this early adoption. Um, the other thing you can do with QME that's really nice is you can use it in CI. So the, the fact that it's got correctness testing that works is excellent. Um, this is the GitLab CI for the David project that, I, that, that takes on every merge request. Um, and it runs basically all of the tests that I showed before under four different configurations for the different vector lengths, right? So just because you wrote some code for one VLAN, it doesn't mean it works correctly for a longer one. And this actually ensures that every patch that's landed uh, continues to work on all the hardware that we care about. Um, and here's a picture of, of the, the UI, right? So it integrates directly into GitLab CI, which is, which is excellent, because then um, it gets the same, same, uh, same level of attention as the rest of the ISAs. All right, so shortly after that, um, we started getting hardware, which is great. So now we can do some of the tests I talked about earlier. So the first experiment we did was we took the Kendrite K230, which was um, an SOC that contained you know, one core, but it had uh, RVV 1.0 with, with length, two, uh, two, uh, length 128. And I, uh, I reached into my box of SBCs and pulled out an Odroid C2, which had you know, kind of the same class of hardware. It has a Quad core A53 at 1.5 gigahertz. It's got Neon at 128-bit. Um, they're not really the same. I mean, if you look, they've got different amounts of cache, different amounts of memory. Lots of other things are, are different. Um, and so it's not a perfect comparison. And in particular, uh, the PMU counters under RISC-V were a little bit immature. And so we used, we used Git clock time, which is sort of fine. Um, and so e even though they're not exactly apples to apples, it's a good enough place to do a test and, and maybe learn something about how well we did on our optimizations. So this is a graph of all of the all of the 4x4 functions, right? So we implemented the rest of them. And what you can see is in blue, you know, you've got the, the timings for um, the C code on ARM. In yellow, you've got the timings for the RISC-V C code. And then at the, at the bottom of the graph, you've got in red the, the ARM neon and in green the RISC-V. And because these are roughly equivalent class machines, you can, you can see that those um, optimized routines are uh, taking up about the same amount of time, which is sort of a nice way to validate that this is working. So what can you do with graphs like this? Um, well, there's, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, so the first is you can look 
for functions where the speed up doesn't really match, right? And here, um, just because these were sort of equivalent, you could see that we were getting, you know, roughly the same kind of speed ups. Um, you can also look for patterns in the function complexity that don't match. So if you, if you look through, you, you might see something that doesn't make sense and you can kind of dig in. So here is uh, the 16 by 16 transforms in, in David. So we later implemented those. Um, Real quickly, can anybody spot something that doesn't make sense? Exactly, right here. So what's happening, um, if you look closely, uh, the green bars are the same height, right? So it means that that particular function is the same speed for the DCD0 and DCD1, but, but the red, red bar is very low. Um, what's going on is there's a, a specialization in David where if you have only a single coefficient in your transform, there's a, a fast mode, and that was missing. Um, David got a GSOC student this summer, and that was the first thing he did was to go ahead and implement that missing function. So one of the neat things I'm illustrating here is that you don't have to know anything about NEON or anything about RVV, and if you, if you have ac you know, accurate benchmarks, you actually can get reasonable information out of them. All right, great. So uh, <clears throat> in April, we got an SOC that had 256-bit uh, VLAN, which is, which is really interesting. Um, the Banana Pi runs at the same 1.6 gigahertz. It's got a little bit more cache and a lot more memory, uh, um, but in, in, in practice, it should be able to give us a comparison from one vector length to the other. Um, and we would kind of expect with a wider SIMD that you would get uh, better performance. So uh, to do that, um, we use this function. This is one of the motion compensation blend functions. You don't really need to know much about how it works. It takes kind of a window of, of pixels and a mask and it does this filter on it and writes them out to this destination. The thing you should know is that the, uh, the width is passed in in the third register, in A3. Um, and so if we run the comparison, um, this is what we get. And what you'll notice is that it's actually running slower, right? So the larger, larger SIMD width actually is getting worse performance, right? Which is sort of counterintuitive. And so you kind of want to dig in and say, well, what's going on here? And so uh, the way that this function was implemented, um, and again, this third parameter is the width, essentially there are um, you know, four different widths that can be passed in, and for each of those, we use that width to do uh, some specialization on VLAN to make sure that, that um, the registers are operating on one row at a time. And the problem is with uh, wide element, we're using M2, that's using two registers, right? Um, on the on the K1 or on the on the K230, but on the Banana Pi, um, we've got wider registers. You only really need to use one, and so the solution is just to do specialization and reduce the the LML for that particular um, that particular implementation. And when we do that, we now see that we're actually getting speed ups where it's exceeding the width of your of your register, right? So this makes sense now. We're getting the kind of performance that we were expecting. All right. Um, because I know that uh, someone will mention this, like that code looked terrible, right? It had a bunch of conditional branches. Um, if we assume that you have bit manipulation, when you have RVV 1.0, you can replace all that with CTZ and get some very clean code. This is only 10 bytes, which is really nice to have um, specialization for wider vector lengths with, without a lot of overhead. So one of the other things that's come up in, in a lot of the work we were doing is we noticed that the tool chains and the libraries that are, are being used for development are, are evolving very, very quickly. It's terrible for an open source developer to encounter a bug and then go do, dig through it and report an issue and be told, yeah, you know, that was fixed a month ago, you got to use the latest toolchain. And so what we did was we produced a bunch of um, developer images that have up-to-date toolchains um, that, you know, for all the different languages that you need to do development, and we wrote them um, in a way that you can basically just download this, this image, DD it to an SD card, and then put it into either the the K230 or the Banana Pi, um, and we've had a couple folks um, in open source projects who've been able to do this, and it's dr drastically cut down the time it takes them um, to do some of the enablement work. This is a great success. Uh, I recently got Aroma 2, and so we'll put an image up for that as well. And so, um, you know, what conclusions should you draw from this? So the first is that benchmarks are really powerful, and they're basically essential if you're doing any optimization work. Um, if you're if you're funding work or you're evaluate, evaluating work and there are no benchmarks, you should go back and say, I need benchmarks to know the performance of how this is working. 
Um, the other thing that's really important is to make sure that you test on multiple vector lengths. It's not entirely obvious uh, that they should, they, should, they should scale, right? You have to do some verification to make sure that that works. Um, QME was a very powerful tool. It's great to use that in testing, and um, CI should, should definitely include this. And of course, as you're designing these algorithms, understand the impact of Elmul. That, that came up during the development here, and that actually changed quite a bit of the ways that we're designing other algorithms that we implement. Um, and then, of course, you really want to test performance on representative hardware. So um, these are the only two devices available today that have RVV in them. Um, as more devices come out, we will test on those. And if you are deploying into a market, you, know, you really want to test your algorithms on, on the representative hardware. And then finally, um, it is actually possible to do ISA to ISA comparisons, right? And I think that's really critical to making sure that you're getting the, the performance you expect. And of course, use the latest compiler. Uh, here are a bunch of resources. So Larry talked about the optimization guide. So the, the learnings that came out of um, the system libraries group will be added to the optimization guide. Um, I've got links for all the case studies for the work we did. That's all public. Um, there will be a blog post coming soon with links to the developer images. And then if you find any of this stuff interesting, please join us. Uh, the system libraries group meets every two weeks. Um, it's got a very healthy set of folks who show up. I think we had 19 people last night. Um, and a lot of the type of content that you see here is, is stuff that we go into in detail. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be in the lounge later today, and I can give some demos on, on this work. All right, thank you. Thank you.